<laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> What's up, everybody? My name is Richard Terrell, and you are watching DO Live, a daily stream show in which we talk about game design. The conversation starts on Discord, and we follow it up here. Whatever we're thinking about today, if you have a topic, you throw it in there, and we just all talk about it. And this is just kind of an interesting follow up. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Discord, and the link to our Discord's on our Twitter. It's all that design oriented. We got a website too, but that really doesn't matter because we're going to jump straight into my stream list here and pick the next topic. And lucky for you, I've already picked it. Uh, the ball chases you. <laughs> we're going to call this reactive enemy design and we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and the kinds I like and the kinds I don't like and why. We're going to really get down to the bottom of this because today I think I came to a particularly cogent insight. So let's see if it's actually true. I'm going to click that and that's all we're going to do for that. Um, so Adrian, you there? You're listening? Yep. What do you think what do you think I mean when I say reactive enemy design? Enemies that react to specific actions you do. It's true. And those enemies can come in a few different flavors. Uh, can you give me an example? Um yeah, like say the Boko Blints and the Skyward Sword. If you hold your sword in a certain position too long, they will actually guard uh, where you're holding your sword. Correct. Uh, let's see. That's another good example. A lot. So a lot of enemies are aware of their environment, right? Um, Red Koopa don't fall off platforms. Goombas are not aware of the environment, but they're aware when they bump into walls, and they're aware when they bump into other Goomba, they reverse pace. So like, yeah, a lot of enemies obviously react to the environment or the ground or whatever. Um, so that's normal. But uh, not all enemies have a different attacking um, routine based on reacting to you, right? And this is kind of what we're getting into. This is what we're talking about. Uh, a style of enemy design where instead of just having like a bullet fly across the screen or a Goomba walk across the screen, we're really talking about like what happens when the enemy tries to get in your face and like he's actually he, it, she, robot, uh, whatever, is actually looking at you and and, and making different decisions based on things like that. Um, so Hollow Knight has a lot of such enemies. We talked a little bit about it before in our previous stream, so you can check that out whenever. Uh, I'm going to pop back into this um, difficult coliseum just to talk in the background. Probably make a lot of noise, but it doesn't matter. Um, so Hollow Knight has a particular style of enemy design where the enemies do react to their, your presence. I guess I probably should have left this Coliseum just to show you the enemies around the place, but it takes so long to get around places. It's so annoying. Mmm. Popcorn. Mm. So, after a load... So, in Hollow Knight, enemies are aware that you're close, like this. The guy tries to get close to you before doing something weird, and then he charges you. He has different routines. You might do a jump and slash, yeah. Jump and slash, dash and slash. And that's all that guy has. But this guy has like a close-up swipe and a projectile, right? So that's two routines that they're randomly deciding between, based on proximity, I guess, mostly, and then maybe other factors. It's kind of hard to tell. So, yeah, that jump is so stupid. Uh, what was it? <laughs> These guys got on. So this guy has another routine. Like, he'll slash at you. He'll block high. This little, ah, stupid, flying, annoying thing we talked about last time, why I hate it. Um, see how the guy backed up? What a jerk. In a game with contact. Uh, damage and you try to jump over him and he backs up like what a jerk like that's a jerk move But luckily you can just bounce off his head, but look he, and he, and he has like a three swipe and look he's gonna do a, a not three swipe look, oh, 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 it's a one swipe. Oh, oh, puts a shield up when you get close up oh, and does what he just killed himself off my gas These guys I think only have one strike these flying dudes and these roller dudes only have one strike as well Sometimes they really look like bugs and that creeps me out Not the right choice of moves. Yeah, Deep Wind Souls are actually a Dark Souls Black Knight and how what has it can attack do up to three or four attacks in a string, but it can 
stop in between any It doesn't have to do the whole thing because it's reacting to you. I think I know many other games where I've seen it is that that's just an example of the problem there. Cool. Um, these guys. So after that, okay, so this guy, he attacks on timer, I think, one, but only when you're near, right? So, like, that's kind of neat. So when you're off screen, you're not going to be hit by bullets. Cool enough. Oh, you shot bullets. You piece of trash. You're, just does whatever. Okay, maybe he just shoots out a timer. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. That was a little long. Two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It looks like it's on this it's close enough, but there might be a tiny bit of random variance in when he actually shoots. So that's kind of annoying, but uh oh, this guy's got Um what was I gonna say? So yeah, some some enemy oh that that enemy in particular um will Slash not hit is so crazy. Man. These targets are so big and the sword's so big and it just like misses. I don't think their hitboxes are exactly drawn to what you see. These guys are annoying. Um, these guys don't react to I think they just react to your left and right position, or maybe it's just pure like wherever they go, they go. It's rare that uh, there's an enemy like that in, this, in the game, but this is a rare example. Uh, I'm trying to get some more. Here's a bunch of them. I kind of wish you could tell how, how hurt they were too. Like, it's cool in games with low health, and you're like, oh, you just gotta count them. But then you're like, you just put eight of those guys on the screen. I don't know how. So like, it'd be cool if I knew like that one's weak, or like one more hit to kill. Like maybe like all the enemies had like a one more hit to kill kind of a piece of feedback. Why don't you touch me? Oh, I was so close. Uh, trying to not make sure, make sure the game's not too loud. It's been kind of loud. Maybe I'll just, uh... That should help. Oops. So, I think the style of enemy design, I mean... The other style is basically like the very simple enemy. And this game obviously has some simple enemies. We went over them. Uh, th these enemies are kind of simple. But they still react to your position. And these guys fly to your position and try to give you the swipey swipe. And you can see his AI is kind of bugged out right now, <laughs> bugged out. Because it's all he's designed to do is just kind of correct in this very simple way. He really doesn't know there's a platform there. Um, yeah, so there's a basic, like, that's a basic enemy. These guys don't react to you at all. And they just do their thing. And I like those enemies a lot. You can do a lot with that. Mario does a lot with that. But Mar even Mario has uh, enemies like the Hammer Brothers that react. What do they react to? They react to if you're on the screen, do they? They, they walk forward and back and they're just kind of complex. I'm about to get hit, aren't I? Ooh, you fired up. Where'd you learn that technique, you stupid bug? And he, and he flies away from me. Honestly. I'm not sure if the Hammer Brothers are reactive so much as they are just semi-random. Yeah, semi-random. Yeah, uh, because, you know, they can either hop between a higher level of bricks to the ground and throwing hammers stationary or jumping. And from there, the only other thing where is that they try to face, is that they face your position. So if you jump over them, they'll turn around. Yeah, so that's, that's at least one thing, but a lot of enemies in these games try to fake the golly. Why are you putting me in the corner? And like, oh, I threw a projectile left slow, and then now you can't get out. I'm gonna throw another one. Like, you're jerks. But anyway, let's get a nice 1v1 enemy. I'll show you more. 
So enemies in this game can sometimes do like one swipe, two swipe. They can react to your vertical position. They can walk back and forth. They can home in on you. That's a lot. And I think all this was an effort of trying to make enemies that are more like sort of less dumb, right? But um, you can see this design in Dark Souls. Um, you can see that basically this style is designed in Zelda, like Ocarina of Time. I don't think Link to the Past. I don't think Link to the Past had anything like this. They have very straightforward enemies. Um, Ocarina of Time had it because with the wolf enemies and the style foes and the dark nuts and the um, the Zalfos, they like jump back. And they do all kinds of stuff like that. They block you. They taunt you, they attack. All that is just sort of an effort to, um, no. Yeah, when you see an enemy dodge you, that's um, definitely more reactive. Because the standard, standard uh, procedure is usually an enemy at most chases you, which means it knows your position. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to adjust itself to be in a more optimal position. So if a steelhead is in front of you and you're in its range, it's going to throw bombs no matter what, even if it could move to be more. Yeah. It's not going to try to dodge your shots either. <laughs> I'm still ahead. Ah, it runs. You're like, yeah, that's right. You get back. We're talking about Splatoon 2's um, horde mode, salmon run, and different enemies found in that. Where's. Oh, I didn't put my compass back on. This is so stupid. This game's stupid. I'm right here, though. Yeah, let's go, let's go down, down and right. This game is stupid. Oh. <sighs> has a way of uh, getting under your skin, that's for sure. I was like looking for my map indicator. Forgot I didn't like, have the thing equipped. So the, this guy, this guy like throws punches like an idiot. Quit throwing punches, you're an idiot. But he only reacts to your position. That guy runs from you when you get close. When his back's cornered, he kind of runs at you. Yeah, maybe he just decides to randomly go at you or away or something. Like, it's kind of hard to tell. These guys are idiots, but these guys are a little more sophisticated. Ah! Their range and their lunging is ridiculous. Let's let's talk about that for a split second. Well, actually, it'll just roll into this. Oh, oh, look! He backed up randomly while I tried to dash through him just to get enough space to fight. So stupid! Like, don't do that in the game with contact damage. It's basically like he has this like crazy body attack that he can just do on. Oh, he did it again! Is he doing it because I'm getting close, or is he doing it because I'm dashing? Let me let me test this. This annoying goober. Yeah, yeah, I dashed and he just did it. It's like three for three. But are we sure he did it? Hard to say. Because when you make enemies react to stuff, it could be anything, right? It could be any combination of these moves. Um, so, oh, no! Yeah. Get crushed. So this is a flying enemy. Let's see what he does. Same swipe, okay. Dash forward. No, he just flies up and down. And then he swipes at you. Is he going to do like the... Uh, yeah, barrage? The, the dive so annoying so him just flying at me already squeezes my space in and then he, then he does a swipe you're like if I didn't have this invincible through you which you get late game by the way this air dash this ground dash that's invincible and you can't spam it because look it's only dark until the little meter comes back it's like once every few seconds maybe one second this guy only has one routine well how boring we'll find another one so that guy was pretty straightforward but he his flying is reactive and then he only slashes when he gets close. Here's another one. We'll show this fat guy. That guy ran. See, he runs in the battle lane like backdashes like he's some kind of melee player. Get out of here. Maybe a Street Fighter player. Maybe every FGC. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm been, I'm been ambushed. But at least you know that if they pull their sword up, they're not going to be dashing back. So I got lucky right there. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm about to die. Zelda 2 is another example of enemies that move backwards to step out of your range. Yeah, I think that's so annoying. Let's it, see what this guy it, does. It is. Let's see what this guy He follows me and he does a, a horizontal charge like that other bug we looked at. He'll chase you down, get close, and then decide to like do something like that. Okay, okay. He runs faster. Oh, but, uh, I just picked the wrong way to dash. And killed him. 
all minor enemies, but I'm just trying to show you what's up. Hmm. Crow. My whole thing is I don't like these style of enemies. Oh my gosh! I killed them. But um The reason why like okay, you wanna make enemies a little more of their environment, more aware of what the player does. Maybe even attempt to counter cheese by holding shields up and blocking in certain ways. Neat idea. Let's think about it. At the core of a lot of this design on a basic level, they just basically put some randomness in. And there's like multiple ways you can tune that to where it's a big problem or not a problem. Not a problem is... Sure. This enemy has a random routine. But... Oh, here's, here's a long spiker. Oh, he does one of these little charge at you attacks, like charge! And then he repeats on the other side. And he throws it at you and just gets another one. You jerk. Let's see when he actually does a charge. Will he, oh! Charge. And then you try to slash him, he moves back. So annoying. These guys are so annoying. But anyway, I, like the whole like so I thought I had a funny idea before. I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if you take an eight-bit game like the old Mega Man's or whatever, and then you make it to where the enemies have a decent enough AI so they can actually play to win? Then nobody would like the game. Like these enemies can obviously do things to you if they knew or wanted to or whatever, or controlled by a player. I've just like ruined the game. Like at randomness. Trap you in corners, never drop their shield, <laughs> like stuff. This enemy does a random two slash, one, or a random one slash. And with the two slash at the end of it has a longer wait time, which is cool, so you can get a hit in. But otherwise, this guy just does this. If you go up, he'll slash up. If you go up and slash up, you can just go to side, right? And all of every time he draws his weapon back, he's already committed to however many he's gonna do, which is. Before you get your decent, he hits t for two, so I'm gonna. And then if you stand there, he almost does nothing until he decides to attack. So I'll just stand here. I walked forward and lied. Sorry. Sorry, everybody, I'm a liar. About the same time when he walks up, he, he decides to attack. Yep. So before you have good damage output on this guy, he still takes a lot of hits, but it's just kind of an annoying fight. Uh, you just kind of rinse and repeat that over and over. And because I told you before, these enemies don't layer well with other enemies. Like they just tend to stack up and make really cheap encounters instead of really like fair, interesting, clear, and layered encounters. Then, oh, I clashed down in his stupid move. Eat it, sucker. <laughs> I made him think I was going to go up by hitting the top of his shield with that whirling dervich. Um, yeah, so I don't think this is a good design. Uh, what, what, what happens when the enemy is, it plays defensive? Like, that's annoying in fighting games, but fighting games are designed around double blind and reading human opponents, so there's a lot more going on there than, um, than it looks. Like, it's, the simplicity actually helps the sort of trends and triangles of your strategies go back and forth but when you're fighting an enemy you don't really have that and their stuff is just random and you know people tried to make AI really like oh the enemy remembers and stuff like it's just it's not it doesn't really work like what you want to do especially for a single player game is to create situations where the player is informed they can understand the risk reward of the situation and then make decisions uh, accordingly, even if the results of which spirals into like emergent gameplay, they don't, can't tell what's going to happen. Maybe they can't even see too many moves in the future, but for the time being, they make decisions that are pretty clear and well informed. So with this style of enemy, they're just like, they get into place and you know they're going to do a random thing. And because of their randomness, if they just did something that like, um, no matter what random thing they picked, it was counterable by the same basic approach. Then like that would that just be like complexity that'd be an, almost an utter waste, kind of like instant dominant strategy. So then if they do two things, one that kind of covers one thing or one that kind of covers another, well then you're like okay now they're gonna be a little more deadly. But then you as a player, you go well I'll just wait for them to do something, then I'll attack. And uh, 
you know, in fighting games, waiting for your opponent to do stuff a lot of times and playing defensively ultimately is not does not give you the advantage. Um, defense, even though it's kind of easy to pull off by like holding block or whatever, you don't win games by blocking the whole time and you get disadvantaged like in games like Street Fighter, you take gray health in games like Smash Brothers, your shield gets small and it cracks. But in this game, you walking back and defending has no drawbacks. So like, well, might as well do it. And you'll just re wait for the enemy to react. Maybe you'll go into the enemy's range and then you'll leave and you'll just wait for the opportunity to hit him. And that's, that's, I don't think that has a lot of um, variety and room there for interesting gameplay. And you'll see a lot of people play Hollow Knight in that same fashion. Oh, the game has a ca camera problems, it's so annoying. I don't want to have to do this every time I want to go down. Where did you come from? Just trying to find some more enemies. Oh, those guys react and kind of try to crash in on you. Oh, I dashed away and it still just curved underneath. Those guys are so freaking annoying. Like the uh, missiles in N+. Like, really? Quit chasing me so hard. Let's look at these guys. So Bug just minding his own business. Oh. Yeah. Okay, fine. Where'd that Bug go? Okay, then he, when he... He just kind of minds his own business, I think, till you hit him. And then he goes, oh, and then he flips onto like, I'm angry skull mode, and he jumps. So another another example of a simple enemy, he just has the two routines he flops back and forth between. I don't remember what other enemy did that. Maybe like the Wigglers or something? From one of the Marios? That's a basic enemy there. So then you kind of, you have to kind of consider, well, what what is your combat? Like, what are you really trying to get the players to do? Uh, what is interesting about it and how do you design your enemies to complement that? Uh, those are like the, the questions. And a lot of times for shooters, like you know what's interesting about Splatoon? A aiming is always interesting. It's always hard. It always requires a level of precision. Uh, it's different for every gun. You know, different... And then when you're aiming at different targets, whether it's in Salmon Run or in single player, you've got all these different things to consider like oh elevation am i standing in the right place am i dropping and are they rising are they jumping and then engaging with that is pretty straightforward but it's just it's just enough engagement at its base level to make everything interesting i don't even know where i'm going i'm just trying to find more enemies so like okay well what is what is what is hollow knight testing like what what do they really want you to do well normally in 2d games they test you by jumping and attacking. So you're like, oh yeah, coordinating your like platforming skills, not falling off this platform like this and figuring out when to attack enemies. Like all that makes sense. Oh no, I fell off the platform. But then when you go into an enemy where you can't really like jump over and you can't really skip through. Did I just go all the way back and now I'm in the city of tears. Um, so then, then what are they testing? Like, there's not a lot of platforms, there's not a lot of jumping, this enemy's just kind of staring you down. And on a basic level, yeah, testing your ability to, like, learn the distances, um, stay safe, and then time things out to where right when there's an opportunity you go and attack. That's pretty decent. But then, um, I think the randomness mostly gets in the way of doing that, just like it does it kind of gets in the way of a lot of. Gameplay challenges, right? If you're trying to refine for one thing and they kind of throw something else at you, it's kind of like, oh, well, I was preparing for the other thing. You're like, yeah, we'll take this. Like, uh, So what I'm trying to say is, you can do your game like Pac-Man with more deterministic style enemies that have a wide variety of effects that make them look random or you can make your game with actual randomness you can make your enemies try to um, sort of um, cover their own weaknesses and require you to play defensive just to um, hang in there because you know you're gonna be fighting a lot of enemies in this game so you can't really just sort of in Street Fighter if you win by one pixel of health that's a good thing in this game if you take every encounter and win by one pixel of health you're not gonna be winning <laughs> so like that's a big difference 
These games are supposed to be built around this fact that you can... Man, throwing a spear from off the screen and flying away from you, that's so dumb. <laughs> that's so dumb. <laughs> Just don't do that. And they're so accurate, it's crazy. Hey, I'm freeing the flies. That's pretty cool detail. So, okay, so then, you know, Pac-Man has it easy. The ghosts just chase you. They got their AI. Uh, what's cool about the ghosts is they have, like, this little scatter routine. Uh, so they go back into their, you know, respective zones, and then that kind of mixes things up even further. So they're not always just chasing behind you on the earlier level. Sometimes they'll just do their own thing, and then after they do their own thing, they chase you again, and that mixes things up. So even if you um, have them all trailing you, eventually that will get busted up, and you'll have to adapt. So I considered the kind of, um, oh, did not hear that because I don't have my audio, my head. I consider the kind of, um, range of gameplay challenges that I like, right? And, we, and you can just think of Salmon Run. You're like, well, what does Salmon Run do that's so interesting? Well, you know, orthogonal design for one. Um, when the enemies have their own little role and nothing else really quite does their role well, you don't need a lot of them. You just need, a, like, two. And they are automatically do that thing, that quality we were talking about before. We're like, oh, I want this enemy to cover its own weaknesses. I don't want you to just, you know, be able to do the same strategy for this as this. And they each have their own way of kind of getting at you. But you break it up into enemies and you achieve two things. One, less randomness. And two, you, you create readability, right? So if you see, you, you have more variety. So these enemies have their little random routine. You can tell once they get to a position, they're like, I will choose this one or I will choose this one. So that's really just one style that randomizes between those two options. And then, you know, you play in the same way. You just find your safe spot and you attack back and forth. But when you have these different attacking styles broken up into enemies, you could have, you know, two of the same enemy, two different enemies, one, two, 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 one. Like, all, all those are different combinations. You're like, well, that's crazy. Like, yeah, like it really does start to layer well because each only does the one thing. And you know exactly what they're going to do. And then that extra complexity, both in combination and sort of how you can really plan ahead. Because, you know, one enemy is only going to do one thing and the other is going to do the other. So based on your distance, you know exactly what to expect. I think that's... Now, it creates more variety, but it also lets you have more skill in taking them out. So instead of like one general strategy that you apply, and if too many enemies get here, you're like, well, I can't do the strategy, so just defend, defend, back up, back up, back up. You're like, no, I know exactly what they're going to do. They each have their own limitations, and though there are multiple of them, I can, you know, cut into the space differently. I can hedge my bets differently. I can prioritize targets uh, differently, instead of just finding the same enemy with the same routine until he dies, you're like, I'll take out the little ones first, then I'll go for the big ones. Or I'll take out the big one and use him as a shield so the little ones can't get to me. All those kinds of things, right? Those kinds of additional strategies and considerations happen when you break things out um, to individual pieces like that. It's not the only way to do it, but it's a really interesting consideration. Uh, so that's what Salmon Run does. And each of the bosses have their own thing, right? They all have their own unique way to be countered. They all take up their own unique design space in terms of size and armor abilities and how they move and how they sneak up on you and how they stay on the shore and attack you and how some cut through defenses like walls and others get blocked by walls, how rain and lasers cut through everything and no one can stop rain, but lasers only target one player. Like all that, like all that's really neat. Um, So, oh, I got some, I got some whatever for doing that, but I'm not saying this. So let's, uh, let's consider another example. So it's time to flip back over. Any questions so far, Adrian? Because I'm, you got to prevent me from rambling. Okay. So this, right now, one of the um, things I'm curious about, or at least would be interesting to hear in the stream are the reactive enemies that you do like. I know for your Neo RPG game, you had a somewhat reactive enemy there, which was the indirect enemy type, where it keeps its distance from the player, 
until the player goes after something, tries to hit it. So, I mean, because I mean, clearly you've done that before, so just asking, like, what are some uh, reactive enemy types that you like and how would you approach designing them? Yeah, so, you know, if you're trying to get, you know, deep gameplay, varied gameplay, complex gameplay, or whatever, um, and you still want to maintain clarity, you want to maintain good feedback, you want to maintain um, fairness for the player, you want to maintain, like, um, a wide range of strategies, too, you probably shouldn't try to make your enemy so engaging that you kind of need to focus entirely on it and react to it just to sort of handle it decently. Um, and that also means, you know, lessening the amount of unpredictable things you can do at any time. So you're like, okay, well, I can manage this. I love it how enemies in the original Mario bounce off of each other and they never stack up, almost never. Bullet Bills do pass over things, but, you know, they pass through. So that's really cool because like, oh, when I see a Goomba, I know there's not some hidden spiny behind it. Or when I see a spiny, I know I'm, I know what I'm going to get. Super clean, super readable like that. Uh, super effective. And like the Pac-Man example, like I said, um, it's completely deterministic. And the AI is fairly simple. They're just different for each one. But, you know, when it puts it all together, all the combinations of the enemy the ghost can trap you and put you in a corner or do all these other kinds of things that are really interesting, make the game really interesting. You see this example of an ERPG enemy right here on the screen. And this is an enemy I built with this ring, right? This ring telegraphs exactly what kind of behavior it's going to have. You'll see here, it moves to the outside of the ring, the ring orbits, and then it orbits inside the ring. Um, so you're like, oh, like, what's it doing? Like, it doesn't move when I'm in the ring. Like, what's it doing? It doesn't even hurt me when I touch it if it's not moving, which is kind of funny. Because these enemies have contact, uh, move on contact damage. But as you notice, I'll do it here. Right when I shot the rock, it recognizes that I'm vulnerable because it's waiting for an opportunity, then he hits me. It's like, oh, that's kind of an enemy reacting to me like I was an enemy in other games. It's waiting for me to do something, and then it's, it's flying in. So if you block, he'll run to your shield, and that's a really good way to take it out. But look what happens when there's two, right? They only have one ring, and they orbit. And because whenever they move, they do damage, you're like, oh, now they're kind of more dangerous. Because when one gets to the center of the ring, the other orbits around it, so it's like an extra bit of defense. And when you shield one, they both rush in. You're like, haha, I can take you both out. And, you know, when you hit them with those rocks, they get stunned. You're like, cool, advantage me. Um... This is the gauntlet. This is not important to what I'm saying. <sighs> this is the first game I coded in Game Maker like by myself. So look, similar with this archer, it moves into place until you're at the edge of the ring, and if it has a rock, it shoots it at you. And it'll continue doing that on these slow timers, but if you press inside of the defense, it'll retreat uh, directly away from you. When it has no rocks, you know the dot inside the circle goes away, and then he has to go hunt for more rocks, but he hunts for rocks more quickly, right? It's because he's like, you know, really desperate. So like, oh, he always goes towards the nearest rock too. And if you take it, he'll recorrect. And he tried to go for that rock in the wall, which is a bug. And I'm like, well, too bad, too bad for you. I tried to put a rock near it, and then he instantly changes its um, path. So like, all deterministic, but highly varied, right? Depending on how much ammo it has, depending on my position depending on what rocks are nearby. Every miss that you do puts the rock that you throw into the field and that could change things later on when more archers and enemies are in place. Like, it's reactive, but still, the routines are still one at a time, which is very Pac-Man style. Like, they're still only ever thinking about doing one thing at a time. They're not like, when I get to this position, I'm gonna randomly do this or this. Like, no, they've got, you know, protocols, they got states. And it works really well together because these enemies are designed orthogonally too. So that's cool. Because uh, you mentioned Neo RPG, I brought it up. I was going to show Mega Man 10. So Mega Man 10 is an example that you wanted me to talk about one I love. I love Mega Man 10. I love Mega Man 9. Mega Man is super cool. I explained in this video series, if you've never heard of it, I put it on my old channel, where I basically go over all the Mega Man 10 bosses and how to perfect them 
with just the end buster. Um, so these bosses are really simple, and I kind of show you what it looks like to fight them um, with no plan and being like just jump around, jump and shoot. Yeah, it's how you play games, right? Jump and shoot, just react to everything. Well, you can't just react to everything. At some point, you gotta sort of um, anticipate what the threats are to some degree, maybe backing up or getting close or whatever, and that's super important. These bosses are all in hard mode, by the way, so. So that's what it looked like, but then I, you know, I say, look, he throws these blades, and there's really only one way to get around them, so you gotta stay on the ground and not jump and walk through the hole, and then when he pauses on the wall, that's your tail to know he's about to get you, so just do a jump over him. That's another strat. When he pauses on the ground, you can either jump to the walls or jump at or dash at you. Just be ready. So this is a perfect example of like randomness, right? He can go from the wall down to the ground, up to the wall. He can go to the wall down to the ground towards you, up to the wall. He can go to the wall down to the ground, down to the, uh, towards you, towards you, and then up to the wall. And like all these different sort of uh, points, right? So you're like, oh, random routine. But the thing is. What I like about this is these moves, again, are kind of designed to kind of designed to counter each other. Like if you anticipate him jumping up to the, dashing at you, but he jumps up to the wall, you're probably going to be out of position and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the movement is really simple, right? So this guy is not like back dashing randomly or like playing footsies with you or flying around like a maniac to make that uh, even harder to deal with. He's just like, look, I'm approaching... You figure it out. And you're like, oh, okay. Mm, popcorn. So, when you optimize it, and you realize you can put bullets into this guy, <laughs> don't jump. So when he jumps away from you, you're probably already in a good position to dodge it. But when he jumps towards in your direction, you're like, you better be ready to run all the way across the stage. That's kind of what I'm saying in the video. His pattern's really simple. But optimizing where you're going to put your shots in, because to do more damage at him, you got to hit him when he's on the wall. But like I said before, jumping's bad. So you got to learn how to put it all together. I, I love these bosses. Um, yeah, this is this is the perfect run where you kind of... Whoa, I saw your wall hesitation. And I like it too, because these bosses... Like, this is one of the fastest bosses in the game as far as charging you. And he's still not that fast. I feel like the lunges in in a lot of modern action games, including Hollow Knight, with their super fast enemy strikes and like they lunge at the same time and their range is too big. Like really, what, what's the point of that? Like what you want is something like Splatoon, again, Grisco, where the enemies have tiny little spoons or frying pans or <laughs> larger frying pans. They come towards you. When they get in the range, they go, ah! And they try to hit you, and they can only swivel a little bit, right? Not too much tracking, and um, that's it. Their, their frying pan doesn't magically expand so they can cover you. Um, the tiny little small fry, they're fast, and they try to you know jump spoon you. But if you just jump away from them, you know you can get away from them, and uh, it works. It works really well. Um, and a lot of people will look at an enemy like that, like, that's boring, you could just, and they always say something weird, like, you can just, you can just, like, no, you're missing the point. In general, you want to be able to master in, like, 1v1 without any problem any of these enemies when you're designing enemies for a layered gameplay challenge. Because if you can't, if it's too random and you're too, it's too unpredictable to perfect them 1v1, then it's only going to get even less fair and less clear when you put more of them together. So every enemy should be straightforward. Every time you see an enemy, individual, you're like, I have a plan. My plan is that strategy that's pretty simple to execute. I just got to do it. Not to say that there's only one strategy to beat them, but it should be pretty pretty obvious what to do. And then the cool part is like, oh, like I said before, what happens when there's a medium-sized fish and a big fish? I wish I can get a picture. Splatoon. Um, salmon. Run. Fish. Oh, that's a decent picture. Yeah, this is a great picture. Wow. 
right here. I said open image and new tab, not bring me to the website, you piece of garbage. Cool. Okay, so look at this. And I might have to draw on the screen. So this, uh, this little fishy dude here, you guys can barely see him when I do that. There we go. This little fishy dude here is tiny. It's like this little little dude. This is the same fish, but he's like jumping. And see this tiny green spoon? That's a spoon. Same kind of spoon that you get in your like cereal boxes, which I commented on last time. Um, this is a normal size dude. It's a chum, and he's got this frying pan. Look, the frying pan's about half the size that he is. He, it, she, ugly, ugly, <laughs> bad teeth. Okay, so he comes at you and he's medium speed. These guys, are, these small ones are fast. These guys are medium. These big fat guys are slow. These fat guys have the strongest hit. These guys have a medium strength hit and these weak small ones have a weaker hit. Each have a very important role because these fat guys block. These medium guys are just nice, you know, mid tier. And these small guys are hard to hit, and you got to kind of point down. And they zigzag when they they approach you. Everyone else approaches you in a straight line. This little jerk zigzag to make him even harder to hit. Really fun. Like this is good. They don't do anything else but that. These stingers right here don't do anything else but shoot lasers across the stage and wait. Shoot more lasers and wait. Uh, these steel eels only chase you and their tails are weak. These drizzlers only jump and then shoot missiles. These fly fish only try to get semi close to you and launch missiles. Like they all just do one thing and they layer so well. This is like the model of layered design. Like this is a model of excellence. So like if you understand design and you understand what you're doing and you have a really clear idea of the gameplay that you're going for, then you design minimally so that the, when you layer things, it doesn't just turn into mush, right? Unclear, cluttered, unfair garbage, right? Keep everything clear. So Mega Man, obviously these bosses are designed to solo, right? They're solo, but those fish in them, they're much simpler, but they're not designed to solo. They're designed to fight whole groups of them at a time. So this is a cool example of com Commando Man. Um, let me see if I can, this is the perfect run. So like he jumps and you gotta jump over his shockwave and then, oh, it's not the perfect run. I'm still explaining stuff. Okay, here we go. Okay, he jumps. You, you so he shoots the missile at you, but the missile only dips down once you're it's near you. So you're like, oh, and then he's also trying to punch you. But every time he puts these pauses in between, and then he never traps you, so you always have a chance to run under, uh, like there. Uh, and you should do it before he actually tra like gets you fully in the corner. So you you know it's completely fair. You should. You know, use the space and earn the space when you still have it, and you can put in some shots otherwise. And it's a great example. You don't know how high he's going to jump. You don't know what kind of missile he's going to shoot, and you don't know if he's going to punch the ground and create a shockwave. But all of it's reactive based on different distances. But those distances are not just like you playing defensively and turtling, because you got to, those distances change how fast your shots travel when they hit the target if you're trying to hit them and keep the damage up it matters how far back you go and if you don't want to get cornered it matters how far back you go and since the missile dips down where you are it matters how far back you go so you're in there you're constantly in there playing against all these factors but it's still very simple like this is a design on nes hardware this is why design is so much more important than technology you can achieve this high high degree of boss design without being unfair and still while making it very interesting like uh, most people can't do this by the way most people think Mega Man games are hard in general okay fine they're hard enough but the, the perfect and get almost all the achievement I got like 98% of the achievements in this game I just didn't get to like play the perfect game from start to finish because oh my gosh <laughs> I totally could have because I could have put it on easy and I could have played Bass, and he like flies around and basically avoids the level. But I'm like, no, I'm gonna play it on hard. Did I play it hard? <laughs> I was like, I'm so stupid. Like, why make it harder for yourself? Because I didn't really care about the Chivos. I cared about the 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 experience. So, if you want to see these videos, I'll, I'll put them in the description. Perfect example of what I'm talking about. Zelda has cool enemies too. Okay, so any questions, Adrian? Um. 
I mean, you were about to get to Zelda enemies. Or was I? Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, the whole deal with Hollow Knight has those more uh, dueling type enemies, mm -hmm. so to speak. And I know you like Zelda, so I'm thinking, okay, so what about the ones in Zelda that are similar to that? Except Zelda 2. Yeah, I don't like Zelda 2. No. <laughs> That's a lot of the same problems. I'm an enemy. I'm backing you up. I have a tiny hole that you can try to hit me with, but you gotta get really close. Like, what is this? Why are you so hard? <laughs> I'm random. Up, down, down, up, up, down, 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 up, 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 down, down. Not yeah, great. But, um. Yeah, that, that. I, I'm not gonna say his name because it's a bad word, but the bird one, that one was probably one of the worst. Just randomly, like, jump in your face. <laughs> Which bird? From where? Um, remember that stupid golden palace, which is the last one in the game? There's that sort of griffin enemy. Oh. That you get a sword fight with. I can't believe they, I can't believe they, they made that game. <laughs> yeah. He, he can throw his sword at an in, sort of impossible to deal with. Like, you're guarding high. Like, those three little pixels in your face but where the shield isn't at and it'll count as a hit and I'm like oh my god you gotta be kidding me <laughs> anyways Zelda I'm just gonna show a picture of the bird boss <laughs> yeah there he it's is it's called a Falco hmm it's like Falco moving on uh, oh no not that one that's the that's a thunderbird well, I just googled bird boss, so you know what? It's called. It's the red one, right? Faka. Uh, there's two kinds. Yeah, F O K K A. This one. Who cares? It's Zelda two. This game sucks. <laughs> I put the, I put it up on the stream. Yeah, but who cares? Okay, so like. You know, and to some degree, what was he going to say? Dueling type enemies? Yeah, so like, you can make an enemy, my popcorn, make an enemy that sort of takes your whole attention. They don't, they won't layer well with other things, but that, that could be fine. Um... Zelda Skyward Sword had a lot of dueling enemies because they had a whole like dueling style sword style. You fought Girahim. You already beat it? Uh, um, no, I finished the Fire Sanctuary, so well, I fought Girahim twice now. You fight Girahim multiple times. You fight like Bokoblins and stuff, and they like really want to do that. You fight like a Stahl Lord or Sawfo. He's like, I got multi arms, which yeah. is really cool. Like, Stall okay, Stahl Master. Pe People want to duel you, like, it's fine. You know, and then they move around, they kind of close in the space so that, you know, your sword can reach and it's all about the direction and the thrust and stuff. Like, they've designed that. And then they have big swipes. You're like, you didn't stop me big enough. You're like, now you have to back out. And you're like, oh, no. Like, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, those guys didn't layer well. I don't know what happens when a bunch of Bokoblins get in a group around you, but I think they pretty much take turns and wait. That's kind of in a lot of games, 3D games. You just couldn't yeah. solve the problem of enemies stabbing you in the back, so they just kind of wait, and you never notice because you're off the camera. Yeah, I guess. I mean, they did throw um, hordes at you. I mean, like the first time you fight those guys, you fight like five of them at once. Um, but I do notice that um, I they will hit you if you're not locked onto them, but mm -hmm. I don't. I've never been hit in the back before, so I do think they have that sort of uh, Devil May Cry ninja guy, and if they're not on the camera, they're not going to hit you. Whereas in um, Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, they were a bit more rude, and it's like, mm -hmm. if I can hit you, I'm going to hit you. Hollow Knight, they hit you off camera. They attack you off camera. <laughs> Great. But, um... I think... The reason I love these simple style enemies and enemies to be a little bit more deterministic and not just have like a random bag of things that they can do 
I like enemies to be more slow, right? Hollow Knight enemies are too fast and too lungy and too flighty and small hitboxes and all this stuff. Like, eh. Um, it's because of this weird, it's pretty interesting way of understanding what skill is. So, like, if the enemy doesn't have any random elements, you can look at a, a situation and be like, ah, I'm anticipating the enemies to interact in these ways to create these threats because there's no random elements and I can kind of, <clears throat> you know, think ahead and calculate what's going to happen. I believe, in my mind, the challenge is going to be X. You know, just you have an understanding of it. You know, like, now in that challenge, I think I want to do Y, Z, you know, A, B, C, D. And you have, like, as detailed as you want of a plan going, like, if this happens, I'll do that. And I'll probably go around here to avoid that. And you can, you can make that as detailed as the game lets as the game is complex and I think that's really interesting um when there's too many question marks like what can the enemy do and if the enemies are too strong you're like I really have to play defensive then your ability to make elaborate plans uh, plan ahead um diminishes and then when you play these games when you have an elaborate plan and it doesn't go well you just make another elaborate plan or you branch off or if your plan had contingencies in it you just kind of like flowing around your own internal flow chart and stuff. But if you just squeeze into a super strict, tight encounter that's hardly fair, then you really don't get that sort of richness of strategic planning and execution. Uh, you don't get a lot of opportunities where your execution pushes you into different trees. It's like, ah, I messed up the one thing, I better stick to it, like that kind of a thing. You don't want too much of that. I just don't think it's that interesting. Um, and the amount of control that you can have. So we're talking about skill, right? And like. Even when you can fully understand a game, uh, like even if you're really good at Pac-Man, if you're not playing like a set pattern that you can memorize and it's the same every time, you're still stressing a whole bunch of skills. All that knowledge is put into play. Let me go to the D card because all that knowledge is right here in purple. Your long-term memory, your your you're filling your working memory, your coordinating with your muscle memory, whatever. All of that's going into play, and you you've analyzed stuff in the past. But it's probably like already pre-analyzed at this point. You're probably doing very little analysis in the on the fly. All that's there. You are playing in the moment still, like using your you know dynamic visual acuity to track moving targets, your eye movement. You're just taking everything in mostly through your eyes and looking at a video game. Like that's there too. When new things happen, you know you use your reflexes to react to those minute changes or unpredictable situations so you're still going to do your reflexes and but you're not necessarily looking for one thing right like enemy swipe walk in attack back up enemy swipe walk in attack back up like you actually get to use more of your knowledge to shape more of your reflexes um, when there's more things to think about and more situations to consider dexterity you know I don't think it really has, it's affected by one side or the other. Um, but again, timing, you know, I say all the time with complex timers, which is this thing down here at the bottom. Can you guys even see it? Yeah, you can see it. Complex timers are like anything that isn't like a straight, solid, consistent beat or a strict set timer for like an animation that's the same every time. Um, they're great, right? But... If a complex timer is like, I'm going to have this weird rhythm that allows me to be opened up for uh, attacking just intermittently, right? So you got to kind of feel your way through this timing situation that I'm, I'm presenting. And then you layer that with another situation where you're like, oh, I can only attack, you know, when the floor isn't lava. So I'm waiting for the lava, the floor not to be lava, and I'm also waiting for this person to be able to be hit. If you, if you stack two complex timers on top of each other, it's like multiplying fractions. You're going to get a much smaller chance <laughs> to hit. So like sometimes the boss is going to be open to hit, but then the floor is going to be lava. Sometimes the floor is going to be lava, not lava, and the boss is not going to be able to hit. And you got to wait till both the floor is not lava and the boss can be hit, and that just shrinks even more the opportunities you can get in there. So sometimes I feel like if you don't have solid design from the get-go, Every time you try to make the design more complex, you're actually constricting the times the player can interact, and you're also constricting the amount of sort of knowledge and the range of skill that they can exert. It just gets smaller and smaller until you just like do the thing, take a hit, trade hits, whatever, like really sort of not interesting uh, routine stuff there. 
So that's like the way I explain um, an aspect of this enemy design. So, like I said before, you know, you build your game around skill, skillful, uh, layered design. You, you're layered because that's a really sort of video gamey emergent way to create a, a bunch of challenges, right? Not just like, I made a whole bunch of super strict levels that you have to do exactly what this is to get through, but like, I put a bunch of rules and systems in place, and depending on how well you do and how well the opponents do, like, different situations will still come up, and you have to continue to use your knowledge and your heuristics and learn over time. Like, that's obviously much different and much harder or much more sort of um, deep than just the strict stuff. Most of the games we play are that style, right? Most of the games we want to quote unquote express ourselves. We want to be creative. We want to see interesting and surprising things. And that just kind of doesn't happen when the gameplay is super strict and kind of uh, forces you to do very limited things or makes you wait in these huge periods like that. So we like the deep style design. We like the, the, the layered stuff. We like the complex thing. We like being able to look at it uh, instantly on a screenshot and be like, ah, this, that, 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 this, that, that, but if this, that, that, and like your brain just goes to work. We like reconciling all those fairly easy to understand situations and uh, observations and trying to, you know, analyze it all to create one sort of unique, insightful, effective strategy. Like that is why video games are so powerful. So I kind of sum up that feeling, right, that experience um, with this this quote right here. This is from an anime called Ping Pong the Animation. And this guy, this main character is named Smile. And they call him Smile because he hardly ever does. <laughs> you can see his face here. He's, he's practicing with his coach. And like, this, I don't like, have the quote, I couldn't find it. Let's look at some other quotes. No, those aren't even nearly as interesting. So the coach was practicing with him and he was like trying to convey you know, what he was doing wrong and what he should keep his eye on, what he should focus on as an aspiring ping pong player. And at one point he's like, you don't, he says the quote here, you don't chase the ball, the ball chases you. So it's like, oh, when you use the right techniques, when you are understanding the sort of interplay of ping pong, like spin and distance and chopping and, and all this other stuff that I don't understand too much. Um, this The feeling of like, Oh, what is my opponent going to do? Oh, I got to react. Oh, what's my opponent going to do? Oh, I got to react. And you, like a lot of people think that high level play in general, high level thinking, high level sports or whatever is all a matter of just like having this mysterious quality to react to everything and, and, and with the right move. But, you know, one thing I stress all the time and that I try to prove in the game that I'm working on in Lighten is that you don't, to play better, you don't think faster. You're like not like running. You're not like overclocking your brain. Um, to play better, you're not just um, lucky and just stumbling upon you know right answer after right a answer with just like a random dice roll. Surprisingly enough, the very way that you think about you know the skill, the task, the challenge at hand, kind of. Um, it changes. At first you're like observing and you're reacting, you're like you're trying to do things and you're observing the results and you're tweaking your your basic observations and heuristics but at some point you know when you really break through to some of the high level play you're like wait a minute like before when I was just doing things and observing but now I can do things to get certain results and I can I see patterns happen all the time so I know that this whole group of interactions can result in this well, if this whole group of interactions results in this, then maybe if I do this, I'll get that. And if I do that, I'll get this. And if that, I'll get this. And all of a sudden, like, it creates this whole sort of uh, interconnected web in your mind. Um, and that, it's when you start sort of using your skill and reaching levels of mastery that are just far beyond somebody who just thinks, you know, every one situation has one thing that you do in response and you just got to do it. So in the very same way that the complexity of life and the way that we deal with it is better expressed as sort of these, these non-strict, non-routine uh, heuristical webs that we kind of navigate through and adjust, this, this quote reflects that same experience in reality. 
and this player is just like, oh, instead of just reacting to the ping pong balls that the opponent hits and just trying to stay in the game, when you are so knowledgeable and so skillful and, and you're so like in the moment, you do things so well that your opponent has to respond or lose and when they have to respond you already anticipated that and then you have the response response ready and all of a sudden instead of reacting to whatever they do and just trying to make the best of it you are actually like influencing them to do what you want and that's you know just a general way of describing when a player is significantly better than the other or when they, one player has momentum they are just like basically controlling the match as they say but this quote is interesting because it puts it in the perspective of the ball. Like, you're not chasing after the ball every time it's hit. You are controlling the situation so much that you are making the ball go to where you want to be before you even hit it, before the, the opponent even hits it back. And that's just like a whole sort of higher level reflection of skill, right? Like the person who wrote this, the person who came up with this, definitely knows what they're talking about. They've either played ping pong or they've done enough research or whatever to realize that this is incredibly insightful. And I'm applying the same concept to enemy design in video games. You don't want an enemy that forces you to play like a scrub, to play defensive, to turtle up, to not engage your full mind, to not use a wide range of skills, to not uh, engage more of your other skills because your knowledge is so limited. What you want to do you know, ideally, is to create video game situations where there's things to know and ways of understanding that and ways of exploring that knowledge and, and internalizing it that you can achieve a, a level of control where it feels like, oh, I'm so in there, like I so know what's going on, even despite quote-unquote random variants, the game is so tightly designed with its deterministic enemies and the, you know, the reactions and the, the interplay and the effects and the range of your player's uh, abilities that you're not reacting to the opponent's randomness. You are controlling all of its possibilities and then dancing around them with your skill. Like, that's the difference. And I think you do this definitely in Splatoon, um, Splatoon Salmon Run, Grisco. You definitely do this in Mega Man. And one of the cool parts about Mega Man is you don't just avoid the opponent, the enemy, but like, when you get really good like that, you're just like constantly putting shots into it. You're like move left, right, shots, left, right, shots, jump, shots, jump, avoid things, shot, shots, and you're just like fitting every single opportunity to put shots in because, you know, the gameplay allows that sort of high skill ceiling for you to achieve and step up into whenever you whenever you're ready. So like I love that, all right. It's super cool. There's a there's a boss named um Nitro Man. And he kind of like chases you left and right. Like, oh, Nitro Man chases you. But then when you get really ahead of the beat, you're like, no, Nitro Man's not chasing me around the stage. I'm chasing him. And you're like shooting him, shooting him, shooting him. He tries to run up the wall. You already shot the bullets ahead of time and he runs into your bullets. Like, that's such a cool feeling to go from like, oh, oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, I can't react to like, ha <laughs> ha, you're falling from my trap. And it's not that they're, it's not that they're on a script. It's not that they're doing the same thing every time. It's not that uh, the spatial distances that they, they happen to land on are irrelevant is it that you've exerted so much more skill around that cloud of possibilities that the whole game is basically skill based in, in a, a very tight almost lockstep kind of way so I'm always going to design my enemies to be more like this because I've done a lot of interesting and skill based things in my life and I find this ping pong quote to be quite familiar quite resonant quite true uh, not only in the games I play, but, you know, music and other activities, and it's just really interesting. And because I've experienced that, and I, it resonates with me, I want to reflect that in my design. And I can only imagine that people who just make super strict linear things that just are kind of flat and shallow, shallow or even beyond that, like, are not fair and have holes in it in the design, they just have never experienced anything like this before. That's the, that's the only thing I can think right now. It could be, it sounds kind of mean, but too bad. Like, I feel like people make things based on their experiences. That's all. You're always making things from your experiences. You're always writing from what you know. And if you try to step too far beyond what you know, then it's pretty obvious because then your story is, doesn't ring true. It's false. It has holes or whatever. And all these other problems come up. And that's why people don't typically like those stories. Uh, yeah. 
So hopefully that made sense, Adrian. You gotta you gotta let me know what didn't make sense. No, that did make sense. Controlling all the uh, random possibilities, I think that was probably one of the key takeaways. And you can see that in your fights, where, it's like, take Commando Man. He can do about four things, but there's still a sweet spot that you can move yourself into to deal with all four um, possible moves he can do to where you're in control of the fight. Same with Blade Man. Same with, well, we didn't see Strike Man in yeah. the stream, but... Strike Man's another example. Yeah, that's a that's a cool point you brought about the sweet spots. A lot of people um, just 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 uh, sort of that first step of synthesizing a lot of different things that you observe about how to you know t tackle a challenge. And you, oftentimes when you put the information together, you're like, oh, there's a it's, you know a spot I can stand that achieves the best of both worlds, or this spot allows me to instantly dodge. The super fast attack and then react to the slow attack right like that's such a fundamental important thing for people to continually work out for themselves that you know if you're not doing that with your fighting games you're not doing that with your shooters like splatoon and you're really just you really just think the entire game is just see something you know react to it and do it and try to get your shots in before they do like, that's not how the pros play they're on a different level they're thinking on a different level but yeah continue yeah, and I think what I, what I noticed with Hollow Knight is that it doesn't seem to really have that. Certainly not so when there are multiple enemies on the screen. To me, the clearest indicator was that one enemy that backsteps as you try to dash through him. Mm -hmm. That is something any Mega Man... Like, if you had a ghost dash in Mega Man, that is something they would absolutely not do. Yep. Not back dash around the same time. And that's the other thing. Is that because they don't have those, uh, they don't have that rhythm, those pause timers before mm -hmm. they do anything, which is what most Mega Man bosses have. Also has your striker too. One thing it got right. Then it can do it at any time, and if it can do an action the same time as you two, and this action beats your action, and you don't know when it's going to happen, then you're screwed. And that's what causes that chicken style of play. Mm. So because it can lock out your actions like that. Uh, basically, the opposite of a sweet spot. You have a, everyone. You have a sour spot, where if you do this thing, the enemy can just randomly decide to hit you. Or yeah. Not. And if it was deliberately programmed to where this enemy always backsteps, to where it's like, okay, yeah, that's deterministic. But one, why? That, that's still, <laughs> yeah, why? Because one is you don't put things in your game. That locks out options that when you play for the first time, it's just like, well, that was cheap. How was I supposed to know he was going to do that? Mm -hmm. Which was my experience with one of the Mighty Number no. 9 bosses. I, don't know. I told you this before, but no one's heard it on stream, which is... He's totally deterministic. But the first time you fight him, you don't know what he's going to do because his tells are not related to his movement. So one of the things that um, Mighty Number, no. I think it's 1 or 2, the fire one... He runs straight at you. So I'm like, oh, he's running right at me. I'm going to jump in the air. And then he jumps in the air. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> and that's because his tails are in his little... His pose before he even runs in the first place. <laughs> so until you recognize those tails, which have nothing to do with his mm -hmm. regular movement, uh, you're spending time thinking, okay, maybe he's going to jump over me this time. No, he just ran straight into me. And, or just ran <laughs> in him. So... Definitely not something you want to have, and that's what I noticed with the um, Hollow Knight with that particular enemy when it did that. If I was to approach that, I would simply, and also those flying enemies. There, another thing with them is that they are constantly mm -hmm. moving. I don't think I ever noticed a moment where they ever held still. Yeah. So you're like, oh, you, you threw your pipe now to get you. I'm flying away. You're like, really? <clears throat> If you can't suss out any sort of pattern in his movement like that, and it just sometimes randomly flies up, but then sometimes it also does it in response to you, that is just not a good idea. Because it, just makes him, it just makes him annoying to hit. Yeah. yeah. There's a boss in Mega Man 10 in another video, Chill Man. And like you mm -hmm. said, um, you know, their bodies have contact damage, so they're pretty cheap if they just run at you. So that's why a lot of bosses will move around the stage by jumping. 
right? Yeah. But Chill Man has an opportunity where he lands in front of you and he can shoot you, he can jump back in the sky, or he can try to run you down. I remember a specific point, which is why I love talking about this example. Oop. I know this one, yeah. Uh, he, he does a certain move where he throws the five spikes, you run into the corner, he runs at you, but then jumps away if you jump up straight up. Yeah, like, he puts you in a situation no where you, the moment I thought saw that, I'm like, that's cheap. Ugh, the only thing I can do is jump. And I was like, but if I jump over them and he jumps back to the stage, I get hit. So I just jump straight up. He, you know, went into the corner and then jumped immediately back up, which is perfectly tuned for you not to get hit. But I loved it because mm -hmm. I had known that he jumps up. I know he jumps back to the center, so I had that like path in mind, and I know that I knew that if, um, he was running at me. The only thing I could do is jump, and I, my brain just quickly like put all those possibilities together. I'm like the only thing you can do is jump straight up and just hope for the best, and it, it worked out perfectly. You're like design, design, design. <laughs> it yeah. was so clear. And yeah, it's one of the it, it's one of those where now that I'm. You know, thinking about this topic more, one of the ways to handle random enemies is, is to have them do things to lock out those impossible scenarios. So, you know, I brought up that one video of Donkey Kong. Like, one simple tuning they could do to their AI is don't have them all move to the left because you're just screwed when that happens. Oh, the, he's talking about the original Donkey Kong. There's, a, there's an interview that Adrian posted in the Discord chat interviewing one of the record holders. And he was just talking about the game on a very sort of high, high, high level because he's like the number one player, right? And he just acknowledged that the game has a ton of randomness and there's just nothing you can do about it sometimes. And they basically maxed out their player skill. And, you know, they all have their different play styles, which is cool. But otherwise, they just make runs of this game and just hope for good RNG. And, you know, trying to figure out how to incorporate randomness and how fair it is and what that means to a, a normal video game or a score chasing game. All very complex topics. Continue. Continue. Yeah. So well, one way to be handled to handle that is to, you know, lock out that uh, permutation and the randomness. Um, but also another issue that that came up with the or a simple way to break it down, which is because one of the reasons why the souls souls comes up with uh, multiple enemies is because they can do things at the same time you do, and you can be fighting say three guys if you hit one guy and another guy like right next to the guy you're about to hit who's out of your attack range starts up at the same time you did there's no way out of that you're gonna get hit Which yeah that's that whole uh, complex timers reducing fraction kind of thing i told you about like to avoid that you yeah. probably just have to keep waiting yeah, yeah. Keep turning. so it's one of those things where it's like if it's deterministic that's kind of lame because Again, you can't react to it. It's like I'm locked into this thing, and then he starts it after I'm already put into a state of commitment. Probably one of the few instances where being able to dodge or dodge out of a, an attack uh, might have been okay. Aside so, from that, I want to bring up two examples based on the things you said: the Bloodborne boss, Shadows of Yarnum, and um, okay. Jewel Man. And one more thing, I forgot. Jewel Man. Maybe I'll just find a video of Jewel Man. Come here, Elton John. Jewel Man. Man's from Mega Man 9, yeah. Correct. Jewel, he has the Jewel Satellite, that's what it was. He has the Elton John Jump, that's what it's called. <laughs> Elton Jump. It's kind of like Elton Brown, but okay, I'm going to stop making bad jokes. Jewel Man is a character that has a shield, so you can't get around him very easily. He's one of the few characters in the game that only jumps when you jump. So when you jump, he jumps, and he's just charging straight at you, kind of like what you said. So you got to jump and short hop yours, and he can only full hop. And then every time you shoot one of his jeweled satellites, it flies at you, which is really dynamic, like really cool. And then he just throws them at you when he's pissed <laughs> and gets yeah. some more. Like That's the whole boss, really dynamic. Sometimes you don't want to shoot because you're like, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I'm going to get hit a lot. And you're like, oh, Joe, man, you rock. And then you just gravity suck it, suck it all up. You like suck it up. You're weak to gravity. Pew pew pew. Good old Jewel Man. I actually have two examples related to Jewel Man right here. So don't forget your Shadows of Yarnum example. Mm -hmm. And this is your um, your deterministic uh, reactions. 
Uh, there is an enemy in the original Metroid called a Rio. Unlike all the unlike enemies that sort of like look it down up? and go back up. Yeah. The original Metroid. Yep. Okay. This enemy swoops down and it actually goes all the way to the bottom, so it'll go beneath your shot, and it'll only until you jump. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I thought that was a cool enemy that uh, came. Yeah, the original Metro has enemies that stay on the top of this the cave and drop down at you when you get near. They have enemies that rise above the ground and then go horizontal right when they line up with you. And this Rio is the opposite, like, swoops down, levels off with you, and then stays at your level until you jump, and then he swoops back up. Yep. And I actually, I think he even moves a little faster than you, but once you understand, and of course, even if you can do outrun them, if you get to a wall, you're basically cornered. But yeah, uh, one of the reasons I found him so interesting is because of how you can control them with your jump like that. Not something, a behavior that no other in enemy in the game has. Yeah. That we know of. There's yeah, still so many know. unexplored creatures so, on the planet. Okay. The second example was the was Donkey Kong again, how the barrel, you can control the barrels mm -hmm. depending on how you move to the ladders because what I am what I'm assuming is that there is a similar homing factor like there is in Zelda, which is why there's that paradox where the further you go into Donkey Kong, the easier it becomes, and it's because that homing factor is being increased to instead of being just pure random. Yeah. It's funny how that, funny how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how they can control the barrels more and put themselves into favorable positions, even if there's like a crap ton of barrels about. Yeah, I was thinking about that earlier. I was like... You know, for any random thing you put in your game, what's cool about randomness is that it's a super lightweight rule that everyone understands. Like, oh, like, why did that happen? Oh, it's random. Oh, okay, I understand. It could happen, it could not happen. Um, then I was like, what's the pros and cons of designing a game where, like, a lot of the random behavior and, and possibilities are just actually deterministic, and you just make it deterministic based on, I guess, something the player directly controls whether they realize it or not? So you're like, I'm controlling the entire planet with my eyebrows. Like, maybe. Maybe that's a thing. I was like, what's the pros and cons of that? Well, sometimes I'm like, that's kind of weird. It's arbitrary linking things together. And then right when the player, if they figure it out, they'll start doing this odd dance to get what they want. Like wiggling their eyebrows, dancing, wiggling their toes, walking backwards, shimmying. And then all of a sudden, like, everything just locks into place, right? I mean, that'd be kind of funny concept for a game, sure. But in general, I think you don't want to just tie things to the player like that. Because you're trying to create a very clear relationship and a very as simple as possible relationship to achieve the sort of emergent effect, the deep gameplay effect that you want. And, like, it just doesn't... The world is just not like that. <laughs> now, doing a wackadoodle dance and getting exactly what you want, you're like, that sounds so weird. Life isn't like that. Well, if you kind of think about it, to an outsider, a lot of the things that high-level players do, they have no sort of understanding of. They don't know why in Smash, like, players... Well, like, okay. So we've talked about this before, I'll do a quick run through. Some basic things that you can do in a fighting game, some telltale signs of like what, how advanced they are playing. The players never back up their scrubs. They're always just constantly jumping in and throwing everything in there, they're just scrubs. Like very basic beginners. The players never delay in their timings or never throw in any feigns or, or never like block. Also, you know, various degrees of scrubbiness, but I mean, they start doing all those things, all of a sudden it's like, well, it's the signs that they're playing on a high level. But you're like, why are those things a sign at a high level? Well, like, it could take a long time explaining it, but essentially making yourself and being predictable is as the worst thing you can do in a fighting game because every move in the fighting game is pretty much designed to have a counter. So if you predict, if your opponent predicts it, it doesn't really matter how strong it is for a you know, balanced game. They, they can kill you. 
So you're like, oh, well, how do you not be predictable? Well, instead of just like walking straight for the goal, which is punching your opponent in the face, how about you walk forward and back up a little bit? How about you walk forward, back up, and wait? How about you punch? Instead of throwing all your punches, you punch, wait, and throw another punch. Like those things become incredibly powerful as your opponent is anticipating you doing something, but you're changing what you do so that you can, you know, vary the timing, get advantages, crack defenses, all kinds of stuff, good stuff happen. It's easy for me to explain. It's very hard to do. It's very hard for people to do until they truly believe, they truly feel the sort of like the difficulty of trying to get what they want by going straight at it. And that's why I often say like, oh, a lot of high level uh, play is indirect, right? Your goal is straight there. The whole point of the game is to punch him in the face. Except for if to do that best, you need to walk backwards. Like what sense does that make? And that makes no sense, but it's because the game's a lot more than just there's a lot more sort of complexity that you're not considering when you're like just go over there and punch them in the face. There's all kinds of other attacks and, and relative risk and rewards and strategic positioning. So to someone who doesn't have that knowledge, high level strategies always seem weird, out of place, surprising, indirect, unconventional. So is it that far off to make a game to where wiggling your eyeballs, wiggling your toes and then doing a shimmy, you know, sets up the perfect RNG like it's in an abstract way it's kind of like the gap of understanding between any scrub and you know high level play right and that, that could be one way you could reconcile or or um, make a, a defense for eyebrow wiggling I'm not gonna make it though <laughs> it's, I, don't, I don't think it's that out there though uh, and I probably would have invoked Pac-Man too because Pac-Man ghosts are seemingly random, but they're actually not. Mm -hmm. uh, the red one, I can't remember their names. Inky. Blinky. Or I believe. Cruz Elroy. Blinky. And something. Okay. Yeah, uh, so the red one's Inky, right? Inky, Pinky, Blinky, Clyde. Yeah, orange one is Clyde. So Inky, the red one, is just a straight chaser. So he's the easiest to understand. Pinky... I believe Pinky is always four tiles vertical and then four tiles horizontal, which, and because of uh, Pac-Man's specific pathfinding, it comes off as an ambusher. And I believe Pinky, Pinky, Blinky, Blinky, Blinky's probably the hardest one to understand. He's not, but he's again not random. He's is I think. It's like some intersection. He's the only one that actually involves two, the the position of Pac-Man and the position of Inky. So it involves this in, intersection between Pac-Man and Inky. Yeah, because he's the bashful. And then uh, Clyde is Clyde switches between two. If I think it's something like if he's eight, if he's more than eight tiles away, he he turns into Inky. But if he's around four tiles, uh, he chases this random point, like not even in the game board. Yeah, it's so off to the that's top how he, left or something. Yeah, so, yeah. so he, he transitions between chaser and, oh, I'm going to go off and do my own thing in the bottom left corner or something bottom, like that. Yeah, bottom right. Which is what gives him his seemingly random but totally not random nature. And I know there's a trick you can do where you can get almost all four of them lined up mm -hmm. and you can control exactly what they're doing. That's crazy. That's how you get the high scores. It's, it's so boring. Oh. Because, so that would be a criticism of Pac-Man. It's so Eyebrow boring. Wiggling right there. <laughs> it's so boring. It's like a speed spelunky ghosting. Like, yeah, you got all the gems down, you killed all the enemies, and now you just wait for the ghost and you kite it around the same basic strategy for like minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes, and it just turns into a bore fest. To get the ghost to line up perfectly, you have to do it in steps. And then you, you hide into a hidey hole that the enemies will never get you. And they're just running a little loop. But the loops are different. Like if you loop around the top left part of the stage, you know, we'll say it's X fast. But if you're the other ghost looping on a different part of the stage, it's like X one time, 1.2 fast, right? That means they're, the rates in which they'll sort of reach the, the repeat point of their loops are desynced. In order to get them all lined up, you have to wait into that desync, slowly sinks itself back up and know exactly when to sort of step in so that they all follow you. It's just, 
<laughs> Just bad fractions right there. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pac Man has a, a couple of uh, bugs with stuff like that. Like, I think Pinky has an um, error, or, yeah. or I think a rounding yeah. error, yeah. where it's only four tiles away and not uh, four die, eight die, or four horizontal, four vertical, like it's supposed to be. Mm. If Pac Man's looking up or something like that, it's weird. But yeah, that's going into the whole reason I brought that up was because of you know, eyebrow link controlling seemingly random things. Yeah, let's let's close on shadows of Yarnum, shall we? Okay. Where did I put that? Let's hope I get, I'm just gonna play this YouTube video and like hope this person doesn't flag me. Cause I'm tired of these. I'm tired of these. Bye, Joel man. My computer is almost maxed out on RAM. I gotta be careful how many videos I open. Let me just close these. Fire. Okay, here we go. So this is a Shadow of Yarnum boss, and as you can see in the bottom of the screen, the first thing that pops up are three health bars, because three dudos pop up. There they are. They each have different sort of weapons. That guy likes to run with his sword. So you need to hide like a, behind the pillow like a ch chicken. Man, this combat is so bad. These games are so bad. But anyway. <laughs> this fight was probably one of my the, my favorite of the game. Because cause all the stuff I was just telling you. Like, oh, if there's three relatively normalish enemies that you, you know how to, they interact because they're like all the other... Humanoid enemies, where you hit them, they can get flinched and yada yada. And there's three of them. Then, depending on how orthogonal their design is and how how much control you have, you have a really highly varied and complex uh, scenario of dealing with them. So like, oh, you know, dodge the sword guy, shoot the mage guy before he shoots me, get around the pillar, like all these cool little micro strats, right? Except for One thing that can easily happen when you put a lot of enemies in the same space is they can layer to the uh, to diminish the fairness of the game. So like Bloodborne, right here, you already have a camera problem. Like there's going to be enemies attacking off screen. These guys have no problem cutting you off screen. Yeah, camera's bad. Um, you're like a melee attacking specialist that has relatively slow attacks. So like when you're slowly attacking one person, what are the other guys going to do? Hit you. So like maybe that's just kind of like how the beginning of the battle goes. Like okay, maybe I only get one hit in, one hit in until I can down one. Then it's like a two v one, and that's much easier to manage. Sure. The range is freaking ridiculous. I don't know what sword that guy thinks he's swinging. So uh, yeah, it's cool like to target someone out, but then then they do a lot of reactive stuff like this. Like hits him, he dashes away. You're like oh, and then he just back dashes. You're like I'm trying to swing my heavy sword at you. Quit backdashing to vanilla. So then when you do enough damage, wow. they sprout into their snake forms. Right? So they're like, I guess, faster and more aggressive. Like, that guy did three swipes. And then he's just like, ah, I'm angry. So then you're like, oh, back up, back up. Guess what? Just like I told you with um, Hollow Knight. When you can't deal with even one of them hardly, and there's multi, you have no choice. You have to back up, back up, back up, back up, and maybe get a pot shot in, back up, sucker punch, back up, back up. And it's not that bad being on the back foot every now and then, but we're really talking about the whole wide range of different things you can do. So this player clearly targeted one down, like targeted that one exclusively. I guess it was like the mage fire breather, which had the least amount of counterattacking up close. And then, you know, cheesing geometry like this. Kind of standing behind it so that they can't get you, but you can kind of get them if you do it a little better. And they just kind of reactively defensive. Man, that attack. He's throwing his snake hands at you or something, or Chimaro style. And like, this is this is not a skill based game. People are so dumb. Like, you really can't approach this. Whatever. Like, you try to get one opening. You're like, ah, he attacked. Let me get one hit in. Except for he kept attacking. I got hit. And now the other guy hits me. From the side, he barely dodged that one. Wow, 
what's cool in general is like, oh, if I know that this sword guy's aggressive, I can pull him away from the mage guy because the mage guy's slow and likes to stay range. And again, that's the whole example of you're not chasing these Yarnum shadows. The shadows are chasing you. Wait, it's the other way around. No, that's it. Yeah. So you're like, oh, I'm pushing them into different situations just based on my positioning and understanding of their aggressiveness. Like, that's all good. It's just not built on a, a good enough base to handle this kind of fight. <laughs> and it's amazing how much they just dodge. <laughs> I guess it's a relatively slow weapon, so you, you, you deserved it. And he did an overhead strike, so it's a little sidestep dodge. But geez. Yeah, that that's definitely a reactive AI thing, and one that I'm myself still not too sure about. Uh, I mean, it kind of depends because I mean there are enemies in Zelda that do actually dodge you. I know the Bulbins and yeah, the like, Lizafos across all the Zeldas backdash. Yeah, they can uh, dodge you as well. Even the Stalfos, they have this little backstep yeah, they do. They did that even and, in the 2D ones. <laughs> <laughs> and then I jump back, and you're like, you freaks! <laughs> yeah. Get back but here. But you get him in the corner, yeah. and throw a pot at him, and that takes him out. Yeah, it's funny. So yeah, like, I mean... The, everything that we're saying is no... There's no easy answer, and there's no s small bit of analysis, right? It's not just like, hey, Stalfos, jump back, you're a hypocrite. Like, no, no, no. Like, there's lots of things to consider in general. Uh, you know, just because somebody even constantly jumps back doesn't mean it's a problem. You could just, the track could just be like to back them in the corners or back them off cliffs. Like, that's funny too. <laughs> so like, it's a lot of things. And when we're talking about gameplay like this, we're talking about design space, we're talking about the possibility of many things happening and what are the range of things you can do to, to address it. Like, that's what we're talking about. Man, when people make these like the whole soul style dodge roll which a lot of games have adopted it's not good i say all the time you need oh. to you need to base your game your basic movement needs to be one of the most effective things in the game mega man he walks left and right super effective they tune the bosses they tune the attacks they tune the speed so that walking if you know where to walk or when to walk is the thing to do jumping in mega man never becomes useless you never replace it until they like sometimes like oh they give you slide and you're like it's faster spam it control yourself not all the Mega Man's have it um, but yeah like you don't want to make it to where the way to get around every enemy attack is to, to roll uh, like you want to be able to have careful and fine-tuned positioning and it can't, everything can't be coarse like here it comes do the thing here it comes do the thing do the one thing because here it comes like that's not it you want to be like I step two inches to the left. How does that change his hitbox? How does it change where he's going? Where he's gonna go? Like where? What wall he's near? Like all that. You're fine tuning. The whole thing about the ball chases you is not a, a binary thing. We're like, I'm going to click chase option. Like no, it's because out of all the ways you control the match in ping pong, every everything from the spin to the speed to the way you hit it on the on the other end of the um, table, all that is within your control if you have the skills and by exerting more and more skill in that way, you, you can make the ball appear to come to chase you harder and harder because you're exerting that much more skill over your opponent. But if all you can do is just one binary answer, hit ball back, yes. Hit ball back, yes. Hit ball back, yes. Like, there's, there's not, it's not going to happen. Like, there's just not enough there to build enough complexity to express that idea through interactive examples. I think uh, another thing I've, I gathered from that short two minutes of the fight um, is that there you attack, the, especially the sword guy, attacks unreasonably fast relative to how fast that guy attacked. Because yeah, yeah, they're like on crack. Like like here's here's another way to put to get around that. Um, oh, the enemies do random things. Sometimes it means they do these things the same time you do it. A way to get around that is make it so that if they do do the thing, <laughs> you can still react to it. Which is like, even in, say, Breath of the Wild, sometimes enemies have super armor. You can see it before they'll ever hit you with it, though. Like, you know that one thing the Bokoblins do where they just, like, swing the thing around their head? Yeah. Like, they're all... <laughs> 
Yeah, like that. They like to put like the all in rage uh, protocols on enemies sometimes. It's scary. Even yeah. back in Perfect Dark, sometimes the enemies just go like whatever and they just step out from behind cover, just like gun you down. Like, what is up with this guy? Yeah, so even if you're starting off with like the slowest attack, which is the two-handed things in the game, you can hit him at least once, see that, oh, he's not reacting now and he's about to attack and get your shield back up in time. Yeah, shields are important for that. People are like, oh, this praise Bloodborne for not having a shield. I'm like, I think shields are important. They let you know the exact moment when the hitbox would have hit you. They let you know if it's done correctly, where the direction that hitbox is coming from, like left, right, top, down, whatever. And also, it's an option. It doesn't have to be a great option, but it's a good option to do that doesn't require tactical roll back. Back up, back up, back up, back up, which allows you to make the footing and the spacing that you did to get in that position still matter even after the shielding. Like, that's important. All that's important. And I want to contrast that with the final boss in Demon Souls, where my specific problem was because of the way, because of how quickly he can attack and he has hyper armor. If I attacked and he started up attack at the same time, because of how slow you were, I was just basically screwed. It's like, oh no, he's going to hit my shield and chip off like half my health, and then i got to run back and heal mm -hmm. all over again. Which, you know... Another topic yeah. for another day. <laughs> Healing. <laughs> Here's the part in the Yarnum boss where you get him down to one, and then there's like this crazy snake. This crazy snake that just comes out of the ground. And just, there he is. Ah, he just hits you from the side. How is that possible? Because he burled out of the ground. Yay. Maybe you could avoid him this time. I guess the snake is like a temporary like attack where he summons it and he gets like one or two bites in. I just don't I just don't think people get it when they make these enemy attacks like super fast and they just like mow you down. You can make an enemy super slow and it will still kill people because you need information knowledge foresight whatever lots of things you need lots of things to play and get around things well so like you don't need to make it blindingly fast and and unavoidably unfair right like you said before the Mega Man bosses are slow do you do, do here I come kills people <laughs> they, people can't beat that so like why do you think you need to make this super blinding fast snake strike from a, off the screen why because you lost your mind that's why He's summoning the snake again, but he's probably going to die before the snake's going to bite. No! Oh, I didn't get to see it twice. So that's uh, that. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is Sakura Samurai. Uh, but I, since I don't have footage of it, and I talk about it often enough, that I'll probably have to wait for another day. But the... Um, yep, it's going to have to wait for another day. Any final comments, Adrian? Um, no, I, I think I... Keyed in on the main things that uh, were important to make note of. I will say that I think the Monster Hunter boss design is the same exact problem as the Bloodborne design. And those games have so much in common. I don't like either of them. I don't think they're good games yeah. for gameplay. They could have all the it's cool another... gear, armor, story, atmosphere, lore. Like it could have all that stuff that you like, but gameplay wise, no. Yeah, I see another tuning issue there where an enemy. The, or the, the monster can attack at the same time you're in the middle of your and it's like well you're kind of screwed mm -hmm. so a lot of waiting around well so and even though it's slower sure yeah but if if it's it's all relative it's, yeah it's all relative it's how fast you go how fast he goes if you both do a thing at the same time you can't lose that's the general thing you need to do with your game you can't lose that exchange that's why I brought up Breath of the Wild earlier. It's like, I can see it and I can still win that, mm -hmm. even if we both started a thing at the same time. Cool. If you guys had any questions out there, let us know. Jump in the Discord. If you actually think Bloodborne or Dark Souls or Monster Hunter has good gameplay, we'll talk about it. <laughs> right? Like, believe me, I've been thinking about this for a long time and Everybody on the internet has opinions, but if you even slightly appreciated the amount of specificity and depth in which we cover this one topic of a very specific enemy type, <laughs> then you pretty much know where you're going to get yourself into a really detailed and interesting conversation. So until next time, guys, peace. Say bye, Adrian. <laughs>